So good evening, good afternoon. Um, I'm not sure where I stand at the moment. I've been uh, conferencing for two days. Um, so yes, good afternoon and, uh, and welcome to MediWales uh, Connects, the NHS Collaboration Conference. Um, we're about to start the, uh, the final session for today, um, our regulatory workshop. And um, I'm really pleased to, uh, to introduce a, a, a panel of Stella speakers. Um, we've got Andrew Davidson from Life Science Consulting, MedTech, SMEs. Um, we've got Pete Phillips, Surgical Materials Testing Laboratory. We've got Chris Hopkins from Haldar. And we've got Ed Spearpoint, who's uh, QAEC co-founder, director and quality and regulatory consultant. Uh, thank you guys for making that easy for me. Those are some of the longest titles I've had to read out today. Um, so just a little bit of um, etiquette today. We've, uh, we've, we've scheduled this meeting as a, as a meeting rather than a webinar um, for the reason that we can, during the Q&A sessions, we can make it a bit more interactive. So, um, so when, you are, when, you, when you're asking a question, if you could put a question in the, um, in the chat, um, but, uh, but we do have the uh, facility to uh, turn your microphone on and your, and your camera on so that you can, you can join in um, with the conversation uh, at, at, at the appropriate point where, um, where, where we can have a bit of Q&A. Um, as I say, today's the final session. We've had, um, we've, well, it's been a superb day um, and, and it's really come together very nicely. We started the day um, with Lucerne and GX and, uh, and we had a, a little bit of a fireside chat there about um, new product development. And, um, and it was an academic project that uh, was developed into a diagnostic test with the support of a whole array of Welsh companies, Welsh manufacturers, Welsh product design. And, uh, and now we're getting to the point where it's, uh, it, it's going to be CE marked and, and, and manufactured in volume and distributed. So really great to start there. And then we moved on to uh, value based procurement and um, adopt and spread which is a program as well as um, what we all want to do when it comes to medical technology so it does feel appropriate that we're um, we're finishing the day with regulation um, because that does tend to be uh, one of the bigger challenges when you're developing a product and um, whether that's uh, from a clinical innovator side or as a, um, a or, or, or as a company as a manufacturer um, so Today and, and this, this afternoon is your opportunity to uh, hear from the experts, top tips, um, issues that, uh, that most people uh, fall foul of, and, um, and, and, and ask your own questions. I would recommend that you do ask your questions, do engage with the chat, because uh, you won't get a room of people like this together very easily again. So uh, this really is your opportunity. Can I also say, because we've got a mix of academic, business and clinical professionals, don't be scared about asking the stupid question because we're not all experts in regulation. I'm definitely not. So if our panel say something that's a bit over your head, if they use uh, three letter acronyms that you've never heard of, just um, just pull them up on it. Just say, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by UKCA or, or, or whatever else it is? Um, because uh, because that's kind of the that's the reason for this event, this this session. It's it's to, it's to provide advice and guidance across a whole broad range of uh, people. People who may be involved in projects that are going to re require regulatory compliance. So please do engage. Um, all, of the, all of the speakers here are, are, are perfectly uh, adept at answering questions, whether they're difficult, hard questions or, or, or the easy ones. Um, and, um, and, and put your comments in, in the chat, even if it's not a question, even if, even if it's a even if you're just introducing yourself and putting your, your web address in the chat. This is a collaboration conference, so uh, don't be shy. Introduce yourself so that we know that you're in the room and that that would be great. So on those few notes, um, I will be back uh, towards the end of this session just to explain what's going on tomorrow. But uh, I'm going to uh, hand over to the very capable hands of uh, Mr. Andrew Davidson, who is going to uh, chair this, um, this, this panel session. So, Andrew, over to you, sir. Thank you, Gwen, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's glorious weather out there, I think, for all of us. And um, uh, this should be a really smooth and sophisticated and interesting session. Um, Chris, for instance, looks like he's already outside. So, uh, so that's good news. <laughs> Um, anyway, just to give a bit of a way of introduction, uh, I'm neither an academic or a regulator. I'm a sales and marketing person. Uh, I've been in uh, medical devices for uh, effectively for 25 years, um, having decided pharmaceuticals was far too complicated. And guess what? This has become even far too complicated as well. So, um, so we have a, a situation where regulation is on the, on the move. 
Um, there are lots of new terms. Um, we're in a post-Brexit environment um, and we have plenty to go at. But I see it in terms of three things. And I'm thinking, I think about it in terms of being a commercial in, uh, individual. Um, I advise members of MediWales on aspects of that. And um, I see it in three things. It's complexity, and complexity looks to me like it's gone through a massive amount of change recently. Who said things were going to be easier? Um, it's cost, because with complexity comes cost. And finally, it's about capability, because in the SME world, getting the right regulatory people, about the right quality people, and not just people of quality, but people who can make these systems work, can uh, follow audit procedures, uh, those kind of things, these are central to what we have to adhere to. Now, um, I don't decry any of that because ultimately this is about patient safety. But on the one hand, we have entrepreneurism, innovation, development, and in Wales, there is a lot of that amongst the membership. That's without question. But on the other hand, we have all the barriers that are there to slow us down. And those are the regulations, be it UK, EU, broader than that, FDA, Canada, Japan, wherever it might be. And some doors may be getting harder to open, but other doors may ultimately get easier to open. But ultimately, we still have to make a better life for patients and a better way of doing things. And the regulation is de there designed to help us start that process. Um, so that's me, um, I'll chair, and uh, I'd like to ask uh, Pete Phillips, the director of SMTL, who I've known for a long time, to just introduce himself and maybe make a few opening remarks. The idea here is that you give us um, your questions, um, we can debate, we can talk about things. There are some experts in the room, as, uh, as uh, Gwyn has uh, expressed, of which I wouldn't count myself as one of them. I just ask as many questions as everybody else. But um, these guys really know their stuff. So, uh, Pete, perhaps you'd like to uh, make your opening remarks and introduce yourself. Thanks, Andrew. Um, afternoon, everybody. I'm Pete Phillips. I'm the director of the Surgical Materials Testing Laboratory in Princess of Wales Hospital. Uh, we are we were set up to test medical devices for um, the Welsh NHS, but <clears throat> over the years, our brief has, has grown. Um, we're very involved in European standards. We um, supply uh, expertise and advice to Welsh government on medical devices, and we represent them at various um, uh, forums, uh, nationally and internationally. Um, <clears throat> And we, we get very involved with, um, we act in liaison capacity with the MHRA and Welsh Government as well. We have the Defect Reporting Centre for Wales for medical device defects as well. Um, the, one of the things that uh, we're going to cover today really is, and I think the focus of what we're going to cover today is the post-Brexit regulatory landscape. Um, since the 1st of January, um, we, we are now in, um, there's a new game in town in terms of medical devices. We all thought that the medical device regulations were going to come in uh, this, this year. I mean, they were supposed to come in May last year, but they were postponed for 12 months. <clears throat> and then because um, the government decided not to uh, adopt the various directives and regulations from Europe, we find ourselves in, in a, a completely new ballpark, really. If, if you want to know what, what, what your devices uh, will need to comply with in the future, the best thing you can do <clears throat> is to do a search on Google for MHRA UKCA. And that will take you to a web, the government web page, Regulating Medical Devices in the UK. And, and if you haven't read anything about how, what the new landscape looks like, that is the first place you should go to. And you read that and you will be in a very good position to understand where you're going to be. <clears throat> it explains where we are in terms of CE marking um, and the fact that that will be recognised in the UK, in, in Great Britain, because we need to differentiate between the UK and Great Britain now, um, recognised in, in GB until the 30th of June 2023. Um, 
it explains that the EU no longer recognizes UK notified bodies. That's why people like BSI have been going across to Holland to establish their offices there. Um, it explains the new way for registering devices in the UK um, since, the first of, since the 1st of January. And there are various deadlines. So in, in the future, your medical device is going to have to be registered with the MHRA. And there are different deadlines depending on which class of device you are go you're going to be putting on the market. If you're, if you're working with a manufacturer who's based outside the UK, you need to appoint a UK responsible person. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm cantering through these because the detail is on, on that web page. And if anybody has specific questions, we can come back and discuss them. Um, and then we have the, the glory of um, a new, of the UKCA mark. The UK conformity assessed mark, which um, is now ac acceptable. And from the 1st of July 2023, you can't put your medical device on the market in, in Great Britain without that UK CA mark, once the CE mark is no longer acceptable. Um, <clears throat> the MHRA are concerned, at the moment, and, and this is a, a holding position at the moment, there will be new regulations that are. Um, going to be introduced by the MHRA, which they are consulting on. They have held some um, devolved administration meetings already. And whilst they have no firm view on what's going to happen with any of these things, the areas that they're talking about at the moment are what should a registration system look like in terms of should it, should it be um, unique to the UK or should it be very similar to what happens in Europe? Um, it's going to be talking, they're, they're consulting on the UDI, Unique Device Identifier, which comes in with the MDR across the rest of Europe. And, you know, there is a lot of interest with UK medical device manufacturers there. So <clears throat> part of those consultations are about what level of granularity should we have with UDI. Then they're, they're going to talk, then they're consulting on what, what UDI system should we adopt in the UK? Should it be GS1? for example, which is already out of the gates in many cases. And then about medical device nomenclature. Um, there are various nomenclature systems for medical devices, which, which, which becomes crucial when you start having databases that people want to reference. And so there are a number of those around, and they're consulting on which of those should be used. Um, and they're, they're also discussing about things such as, should these databases, these UDI databases, be publicly available? Um, because in, up until recently, certainly up until the MDR, um, there's been quite a lot of secrecy around me medical device databases that are around in Europe. If, if you're from the, within the NHS, you were probably caught up in work that Welsh Government were doing over the last couple of years, um, read, led by Rob Orford in Welsh Government, which was about um, the fact that in the MDR, healthcare institutions would no longer have a get out of jail free card and we're going to be regulated. We are back to being, as it were, unregulated um, for, for medical devices in the NHS at the moment for in-house manufacture, but they are now trying to, trying to work out what the NHS's appetite is for regulation. And there's uh, further discussions going on about software as a medical device, which if you're in that field, um, I, I don't envy you. It is very complicated and uh, with th there is a lot of interest about the impact that's going to have on NHS in-house manufacture as well. The, for the, the, for the, during the afternoon, I think what we'd like to do is to create the sort of questions, if we can help answer them. We've got some, some people who are, uh, you know, work, work with manufacturers, helping them to comply with regulations such as Ed. Um, but I think we're going to try and curate those questions. Medi Wales then will, when the MHRA come up, go out for public consultation on these, they can represent their members and, you know, act, uh, you know, rather than in, in individuals going to the MHRA, Medi Wales will be able to um, put your, uh, your thoughts and directions of travel to um, the MHRA. Um, I think that's everything I want to say for the moment, uh, Andy. Thank, thanks, uh, thanks, Pete, for that. Um, just one quick one, though. On the NHS and regulation, um, does that mean that um, 
sterile services departments no longer have to see EMARC products? Um, the, so th they've, ne they've never had to if they're, if they're doing them internally. They, they've, only had to, they've only had to do it if they were giving it to a, a, a different organisation. Okay. But the, uh, the Welsh Government insisted on them complying with the directive in the early 2000s as part of a refurbishment programme for SSDs. So it was thought to be good practice then. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks very much, uh, Pete. Uh, Chris, perhaps you'd like to, uh, that was a very fulsome uh, start point with lots of questions, even though I've got some more. Chris, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself and um, explain where you see the regulatory landscape before we pass on to Charles, mm -hmm. aka Ed. Thanks, Andy. Um, nothing left for me to say, really, um, with a <laughs> comprehensive sort of summary, really, of, of where we are, Pete. Um, I'm Chris Hawkins. Um, I'm, um, I'm head of clinical engineering down in Howell Bar. The main sort of part of that function is to the management of over 32,000 medical devices across the four main acute sites and community hospitals. But we've also got a newly developed team as well, um, looking at supporting innovation and research, um, in particular looking at new novel medical devices and, and software and, and apps and, and the like. Um, so we're very much living and breathing this space with, with a number of our colleagues at the moment waiting for the specific guidance to come out from, from MHRA. Um, I, think, I think we know, you know, roughly what we're looking at. What, what I would say, to, to add to, to Pete's comments, really, I think it's, I think it's important that, that everybody feeds back on the consultation document that will come out probably around, what are we saying, Pete, around sort of June time, I believe, this year? Is that what they're proposing at the moment? I think you're on mute. Uh, they were talking about the summer. I would, uh, uh, at the moment, I'm not going to hold my breath on anything. Yeah. Okay. So once that consultation document comes out, you know, it's important that NHS, you know, commercial providers, academics, everybody sort of feeds into that because I know a lot of their concern at the moment, particularly from a manufacturing perspective, is, you know, the, the link between us and Europe. Um, that, you know, we, we need this as streamlined as possible for everybody's benefit, really. You know, we don't want really in an ideal world we don't want different badges across you know across the eu and and the uk being a going going along a sort of completely separate line so so whereas it is a different badge because they're calling it you know um, ukca rather than ce um we want you know we want some sort of commonality really between a ce mark and a ca mark as well you know that would be the ideal situation for everybody concerned um so yeah nothing further to add really um to that andy Thanks for that, Chris. Um, Charles, or oh, sorry, Ed, would you uh, would you like to sort of uh, give a bit of an introduction? And because you will see it probably from the uh, the industry side, um, just as much as I would, uh, but in more detail, I'm sure. So over to you. Yes. Good afternoon, all gents. Um, Andy, you touched on complexity, costs, and capability first and foremost, and then Pete gave or more prescriptive detail around the MHRA and changes in accordance with, regular, with regulations. My background essentially goes back coming up 25 years now within the industry, working across life sciences, pharma, medical devices, all classification types, and spent many years um, managing teams within manufacturing facilities, um, re representing them as an independent consultant on a global platform, working in many countries, building technical file submissions, FDA, MHRA, notified body involvement throughout. But essentially what I'm seeing with new reg regulations and the requirements surrounding um, the articles and the annexes, in particular when, when we get down to the, the M MDD, compared to the IBDR and, and where those two directives, if you will, sort of cross over, but there are variants in and around certain elements and requirements in accordance with. What I'm currently doing and what I'm experiencing working with uh, predominantly manufacturers or startup companies within this sector is I have developed transparency across every article, every annex, aligned to a given quality management system so that there is no 
as I would term it, fog and mist or misinterpretation of requirements um, supporting their products um, and further supported by the technical files for the purpose of the MHRA review, depending on the classification of said product. So I can get into, you know, a lot of detail, a lot of discussion around what those requirements mean, how, how, how they then get implemented within a given organization, how I support that organization. Um, given my experience and my wealth of knowledge within this industry, I can pinpoint any point of discussion or article or requirement per se. I've been recently challenged around um, how consultants can sort of claim that they have the, the competence and the skills to provide those services within the industry. Let me tell you, there's an international standard there, ISO 119, which defines how manufacturers and companies can go about selecting those consultants, i.e. you're looking at one today. Um, so I can tick those boxes, I can advise accordingly, you know, beyond complexity, costs and capability, there's this element of you know, further training, development and understanding in relation to the MD, MDD and the, um, the IBDR requirements. And you know, it goes without saying, this entire industry is all about patient safety, but also the message that I put out when I go into organizations and provide training, support or direction is that everything is driven by risk management, first and foremost. Once we've understood what the device classification is, there are 10 steps for a company to bring about a technical file in relation to its product products for MHRA assessments and essentially approval for that device to go to market. So you're absolutely right, Andy, there's a lot of complexity going on at this moment in time. And Companies will look at costs, they will look at um, the capability within their given organization through their regs teams, through their quality teams to predetermine how they understand and comprehend what the regulatory determination changes mean in relation to bringing a new product to market, depending on its intended use and purpose. The marketplace for said product, is another big sort of you know challenge in in terms of meeting specific requirements for market entry. Um, all of which, as I've said, you know I've spent now on 25 years now, and more recently you know supporting many many companies um, on a go forward um, to enable them to you know walk through the maze, whether it's you know putting product into the US. We know about the FDA, we know, you know the MHRA are currently reviewing the regs going forward that Pete, Pete alluded to. But as I've said, you know, given the complexity and understanding of exactly what is required to enable manufacturers to continually um, sell and distribute products on a global platform. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, I think you raised some uh, good points there. Actually, um, you mentioned the uh, the consultant um, standard. Um, is that something that um, everyone should be looking for? Uh, in other words, is it worth putting that into the chat so uh, those on the call can actually take a note of it? I mean, is that something that you see being a re an absolute requirement? And is it specific to medical devices? I've missed that point. Uh, it's more related to, to general industry, but uh, more recently, what, what I've experienced, um, Andy, is being challenged around why I can and should be able to support uh, a given client. So when, mm -hmm. when I'm being challenged, I will refer the client to that standard um, to enable them, first and foremost, to decide that they're speaking to the right person with the right ability, competence, skill set necessary for them to make a determination around taking that consultant for a contract for support services or yeah. training or training which is you know pertinent to where we are today uh, to enable others to understand more so 
you know, what those changes are and how they impact. Okay, great. No, th thanks for that. Appreciate it. You've raised some uh, some good points there. Um, so I, I, I see that the, the from what Pete had said, and I think we're all in agreement here, that getting some airing some thoughts in terms of consultation is quite a useful thing to be able to do. Um, Pete, you mentioned databases. Well, we'll, I'm looking at the chat, waiting for questions here. Uh, but you mentioned databases, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but the Udemed database, which I'm assuming sits behind all of this, and particularly on patient safety, um, I believe, I don't know if we have access to this, first and foremost, I think he's going to shake his head. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, it, it seemed to keep kicking that can down the road. And, um, and, and I wonder, you know, how, how do we think that should be moving forward as far as the UK is concerned? Do we try and mirror? Do we try and create our own? Is it going to take us twice as long to do it as a result? Because Udemed seems to have been on around for, I'm not sure, is it about four or five years now? Okay. Something of that order. Yeah, as, so um, th that's exactly one of the things that the MHRA would, would like, uh, you know, GB industry to give their views on really because it's industry in the in, in the first instance who are going to be impacted mm -hmm. by that um and the, you know that they, they want to know whether the, they think there's any benefit to having um a uk or a jeep sorry a gb only um system or whether it should mirror the Ud udemed system now to me logic it, it seems logical that, it, that the more that we can mirror the European system, the easier it will be for GB industry, because you you won't have to learn two completely different strands mm -hmm. of um, regulations, have two different data sets that you're going to be using. So, my, my my intuitively, it seems to me that the logical thing is to follow as closely as possible um, whatever the U Udemed are doing, and whatever the EU are doing in terms of. UDI and GS1 and things like that. Um, that's that's a good point, and I th I think it's uh, uh, I, I don't know if Chris has a, a comment he wants to make, but um, it looks to me like the um, we are in danger of following Europe without having a particular influence if we're not careful here. Um, so you know, on the one hand there's complexity, on the other hand there's compliance i suppose is the best description um and probably that that comes down even more so when you're talking about udi which was another point that you mentioned um i think um certainly up until now most of the medical device manufacturers in the uk probably have a, uh, ed's probably got a better fix on this but probably would be working towards a gs1 approach um uh, although those with the fda requirements might might be a bit different there so Chris, you've come on, uh, you've unmuted yourself and appeared again. Um, do you want to throw your five penny worth in? Because new products in particular, they've got, <laughs> they've got a more slippery slope to climb these days. I just, I just wanted to sort of um, follow up on, on some of Charles's comments, first of all, if I can, um, mm -hmm. Andy. 100% um, agree with what Charles is saying. But from general feedback, um, as far as a number of these sort of events is concerned, you know, there's a lot of worry and a lot of concern out there. And one of, one of the reasons we, we sort of developed a new team um, down in Howell Dar was, was, was to support the likes of local um, industry and local sort of technology firms to, to step into that healthcare market. So the only thing I wanted to say in relation to, in, in relation to the complexity, because there is complexity at the moment, there is uncertainty at the moment, but, but I don't want um, particularly our commercial sort of um, friends and colleagues to think that, you know, this is far too expensive. This is far too complex. You know, we, we're not going to step into those realms because, you know, there are lots of companies locally, med tech companies that, that really should be within this environment. So I just wanted to sort of um, 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 just to sort of follow up on that point. As, as, as far as Pete's comments around, um, you know, similarities between us and Europe, um, whether we like it or not, you know, and, and I can speak from my own perspective, if we're purchasing, you know, medical devices from a number of different companies, it becomes very difficult for us when we have to deal with a UK regulatory free framework and an EU regulatory, regulatory framework, which is completely different. So, you know, the, the important point for me is, and I know there, there, there's always politics um, around a lot of these things, but at the end of the day, we want it as similar as possible. 
I'm, I'm very, very um, pleased um, around the bill um, that MHRA have um, just received or did receive um, royal assent for because the, the main focus around that bill was patient safety and learning from um, a few of the, re the recent um, reports um, that have looked at medicines and medical devices in particular across the UK. Um, and I think, I think we can get this right. I think, you know, that I think we can, we can have a number of tweaks at a UK level but also follow the, the, the EU position. And that's, that's the ideal scenario, I think, for, for everybody concerned. Uh, thank, thanks, Chris. Uh, that's, you, you make a, a good point there. Um, Gwyn's asked me to make sure we cover what UDI, GS1 and FDA are very briefly. Um, Pete, I think you've already covered that UDI is unique device identification. Um, which in my world is barcodes, probably 2D barcodes to get enough data onto the uh, device itself, particularly if you're talking of small items. GS1, um, I can't remember what it stands for, is it Global Standard or something or Global Something, which is the system that they use for barcoding and FDA is the Food and Drug Administration that regulates the US. Um, uh, so uh, I'm sure, sure someone can add more to that so that it's clear for everyone. Ah, Chris has put something up on GS1, that's, uh, that's good, or GS1 UK, which is a membership organisation and you get codes for your company and then individual codes for your product. Um, and it's a good way of tracking the, the individual uh, products, batch, device, everything. Um, uh, I think you could say it drags us into the uh, where the retail world has probably been for the last 15 to 20 years, if not longer. Um, but uh, we seem to have got a, a, a degree of, um, I, I suppose, what's the right word? Uh, we're all sharing the same view that we want it to be as simple as possible. But a question I've got, which I know sort of uh, lies in there somewhere, is with uh, Pete has been quite careful to refer to UKCA, which is really GBCA. Mm. Um, but where does uh, UKNI fit into all of this? Because um, that is a of complexity. That's a real head scratcher for me. Yeah, the, the, I mean, there, there, there are, if, if you have a look at them, the link that Isabel posted um, about regulating medical devices in the UK, um, it, it does explain the, the the unique requirements then for, for Northern Ireland in terms of registration, UK responsible uh, person, um, and uh, the, the fact that in the CE mark, for example, will continue to be accepted in Northern Ireland. So it, it, we, we are in a slightly Alice in Wonderland situation. Um, now, now, you know, when, once, once the uh, CE mark acceptability within the UK has expired, we find ourselves in a weird situation where, where CE marked devices can go into Northern Ireland, but not here. Um, I can't quite recall what the UK CA position is for Northern Ireland. I have a feeling that they, they, may, they may well accept the UK CA, but don't take that as gospel. I would need to reread the MHRA thing. But it, it does make it difficult, Andrew. You, you, are, you are correct. It makes life more, more complicated. Um, Ed, that, I don't, I don't know whether you... We would put Sorry, sorry, Pete. Is that something that we'd have to be simplified in any consultation? I, I, or do you think I, it's I don't think that? I, I don't, I don't think that. So I, that's going to um, be something that we can because I think that's all tied up with the Northern Ireland agreement. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I have to say, the I find that element of it very complicated. If it's something that people uh, have a, an issue with and they'd like clarity, I am certain that we can get clarity from the MHRA because the, in the last 12 months, the MHRA have, have really stepped up to the mark in supporting both the NHS and industry. And they're, they're definitely in listening mode at the moment. So um, I'm sure we can get something out to them on this. Just taking a, thanks for that, Pete, taking a wider view, um, which I think has MHRA backing as well. Um, whilst the, let's call it the, the CE mark, the UKCA, U, UKNI, whatever it might be, is more complicated in the European setting, um, there are two questions in my mind, and maybe, uh, maybe Charles has got a perspective on this across the industry. And the first is that there are um, suppliers, medical device suppliers, who are 
um, looking at their regulatory burden and saying, do you know, we're not going to bother registering in the UK. Um, I've definitely heard this from an American uh, supplier because sales aren't enough. We'll do, we'll supply Euro Europe with our CE mark, possibly Northern Ireland as well. But they're, they're actually taking a view um, that they, um, they're not going to be too bothered about getting a UK mark. Um, I don't know, uh, Ed, if you've got some, some sort of perspective on that, but it does seem to be an issue that the NHS are probably going to have to deal with. Yeah, I'm, I've been dealing with clients more recently that are taking that stance, um, Andy, and you're right. And I mean, from a commercial perspective and from a, a litigation perspective as well, the, 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 ten, the tendency is, or the thought process is that, you know what, let's not bother with the, the UK CE mark. Let's, let's go through Europe and distribute beyond. Um, so there has been a slight sort of change in the curve if you will, with regards to the mindset from a, both from a marketing perspective, but from a regulatory perspective, given, given the complexity and the issues that are being, um, for want of a better word, forced on UK manufacturers, um, should, should they decide that they want to go down that path, but um, give them a much more expedient route to market. Um, they're, they're looking more at a European um, pathway than a UK pathway. Andy, I, I think I think it's a, a, a very good question, it'd be, and it'd be nice to get a, get a, a feeling of the room um, in terms of do, you know do we think that it were, whatever these regulations look like ultimately, the easier that we make it for manufacturers, whether they be based in the U.S. or ab abroad or or in the U.K., the easier we make it for them to create a device, regulate it for the EU, and and, and so that the difference between that and whatever they have to do for GB is as easy as possible, that reduces the likelihood that we are going to have um, manufacturers doing it, as, as you said, not, not, not bothering with the UK. Because um, I think there's two issues here. What we don't want is global manufacturers cutting the UK out or, or GB out of the loop because they can't be bothered to do it for one country. And secondly, UK manufacturers who export globally, we want to make life as easy for them as well. They, they presumably will still want to sell in, within GB, um, but we need to make it as easy as possible, I, I suspect, that, so that they can sell across Europe, at, which is the nearest market, and within, within GB without having to jump through two very different sets of hoops. Um, and perhaps that, if, if, if there is a feeling that that's the direction of travel people would like to see, perhaps it's worthwhile, you know, um, as, as, or MediWales reporting that back to the MHRA. I, I, I think that's a good point. And I think, um, you know, certainly the, the feedback that uh, Ed and I have given um, suggests that that is probably <clears throat> being thought of. Um, and it's understandable. There is a prag there are pragmatic reasons, and UK is a big market, but on its own, it's another com another uh, complex strand that has to be taken account of. Um, taking a more positive view, on the other hand, um, I, I think it was it might have been uh, Chris who actually mentioned this that uh, that the MHRA or oh, it was Pete, the MHRA are more um, proactive, and they certainly I think they're great supporters of industry. But do we do we balance more complexity with um, better future trade agreement opportunities? Um, you know, I've heard the MHRA trying to um, get membership of the IMDRF, which I'm sure Gwyn is going to ask me to explain. But I'll ask my learned colleagues to give me the, what that actually stands for um, and things like MDSAP. So does it mean that, Aust uh, that well, not possibly Australia and New Zealand, but certainly US, Canada, Japan, Brazil become uh, easier access for uh, something that the MHRA are more closely aligned to? Because if we're losing something or finding one side harder to do, are we finding something else easier to do? Um, and I'd certainly welcome thoughts on that from um, from the rest of the panel. And uh, as Pete mentioned, we're keen to hear from 
delegates uh, on this call as well as to what they think because uh, I'm sure we've got a range of people from startup innovators academics and industry um, and it would be good to take more soundings than uh, than just from the speakers so uh, perhaps uh, perhaps someone could give me a thought on uh, where the MHRA are going as far as wider trade opportunities are concerned, because that could be a major benefit. Um, I am not aware of um, the MHRA making any noises about, about that in the forums I've been at, Andy. Um, I have to say most of the forums I've been at are, are more about the NHS as a purchaser of medical devices, of course. And so the NHS isn't that bothered as, about, about uh, trade opportunities for GBUK. Um, so I, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Okay. Um, Chris, you're, uh, you're touched. You've got something to say? Yeah, no, similar to Pete, to be honest, Andy. We, we, you know, I've not heard anything through through the various forums um, and, and selfish as it may sound i'm i'm only interested in the in the uk at the moment um so yeah i've not heard any soundings at all really no okay okay um ed do you have any any perspective on that or anybody else for that matter hi andy um only from an, an mb sap perspective which you've touched on obviously you know mb sap is uh globally harmonized, um, synchronized to, to meet the requirements uh, within the industry across, across those regions and territories. And, um, but beyond that, as, as the other guys alluded to, I've not heard anything either. But, um, yeah, MD SAP is, is the go-to place currently for companies that want to sort of get into those other markets. Um, in that process within that system now in my in my experience i i picked up i think it was bsi but certainly one of the notes one of the notified bodies that remain are actually quite keen on people moving to mb is that is that still the case or is that becoming more the case i should say um more Recently, clients have sort of alluded to me that they are thinking about, you know, transitioning to MD SAP from ISO 13485 21 CFR, uh, where they've been, you know, predominantly positioned around um, where they want to do current business. So there are discussions, there are opportunities for companies to further develop the systems to enable, you know, um, accreditation to to get into those markets but beyond that um that's you know a commercial decision basically within a given organization do you want to okay. explain ed a little bit about M md sap and the benefits um of it if, if adopted say again peter do, do, do you want to explain a little bit about md sap and the benefits if that single audit procedure is you know becomes widely adopted Yes, essentially, because if you take uh, if you take an FDA, FDA stance on MD SAP, um, the FDA automatically recognise that is a global harmonised standard that companies um, are aligned to and compliant to. You know, from a Brazilian perspective, from a Japanese perspective, from a European perspective, you know, you, you get into the realms of complexity around systems and procedures that support the manufacturing processes that produce the products. But essentially we're talking one language now. You know, if somebody says to me, what are the benefits of MD SAP? Well, where, where do you want to do business? And why, you know, what, how do you think you're gonna get into that market without MD SAP? Um, MD SAP is basically um, a complete quality management system for, for global distribution and um, opportunity for companies to um, to trade and and is is it uh, the IMDRF the International Medical Device uh, I can't remember what what the um, RF regulators regulators forum is forum. it yeah um, is is that being is the aim for that to be for MDSAP to be adopted by them because they they because they haven't actually made that much progress, I don't think, I, IMDRF so far, have they? 
I've not seen or heard, heard anything along that subject matter, Peter, but as I've said, a lot of companies are now looking, you know, since we've come out of at Brexit and how they want to trade going forward and with the regulations as well, you know, and how does MD, how does MD SAP then sort of align to MDR and IVDR because of the complexity around, you know, th those procedural requirements. So there's a lot of discussion around how, how things can be simplified and we can get to one language, one set of requirements, um, as you've said, the MHRA, I think they're looking at all of this in terms of, you know, coming up with maybe additional regulations that bring everybody together under one system. You, you look at companies that have ISO 9001 as opposed to 13485 or companies that have got 13485 that then want to transition to MDSAT. And that's the main reason behind it, because... Um, as I've said, you know, um, notified bodies, the MHRA, the FDA, um, they want to understand how technical files are being maintained, but also meeting the general safety and performance requirements in relation to device classification. Um, if, I'm, if I'm looking for a manufacturer that's got MD SAP, as opposed to 13485, I know where I'm going to go. I'm going to go down, down into MD SAP because therefore filling all of those market um, regulatory requirements from, from a quality management perspective. One stop shop, essentially, yeah. you know, it's no, there's no beating about the bush. Well, what if, you know, there are different requirements against different standards. And then when you break down into, you know, Alex, one of the MDR and, and the requirements with regards to design and manufacture and information supplied with the device, um, and you're getting into all of those evaluation requirements um, to determine whether they can be met and what a company has to do going forward to enable continuity of information aligned to the notified body for the purpose of, you know, their distributors and um, their technical files um, that support their, their, their products and, and the portfolio products going forward. A lot of organizations are now sort of streamlining existing products that mm. they don't see, you know, the necessity to, to want to um, maintain those technical files in relation to the new regulations going forward. So they are forward thinking, but long story short, MDSAT would be um, the way to go. So do, do you think then that, that that would be something else that MediWales could take um, back to the MHRA as part of when they, when they come out for their public consultation? I don't see why not. I think it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion around MDSAP for many, many reasons. But as I've touched on there, you know, um, from, from a commercial perspective, from an opportunity for existing manufacturers to be widely recognised outside of you know, UK, DB for the purpose of um, business continuity and to enable, you know, a bigger market share um, with, with their distributors. All right. Um, I just wonder, by the way, Gwyn and, and Debbie, if at, at, at in future, um, it may well be worthwhile having a seminar on something like um, MDSAP and... Um, the global regulatory stage because, um, you know, we, we post-Brexit, post some companies are certainly trying to see if, the, if there are other markets available. Um, and there are people around like um, Eamon Hoxie, who used to work in the, in the MHRA, who, who writes extensively in this area and, and is um, a very good speaker in this uh, arena. Okay, that's, that's so, Oh, good. Sorry, after sorry. you. Yeah, sorry, I just thought I'd have to come back and uh, respond to that. Yeah, um, absolutely. And um, as you say, Pete, the MHRA definitely are in listening mode and um, being responsive. So uh, we can probably get the MHRA in front of the MediWales membership to uh, to respond to that point and also to um, to discuss the um, yeah whether in, whether MHRA feel they have a role in supporting international trade. Um, in, and uh, you know, managing regulatory equivalents in in respect to um, to uh, not be creating a barrier to international trade at the very least, but uh, I'm not entirely sure they'd have a view on that. Uh, I, Gwyn, can I can I add something there? Because um, I think if Phil Brown was on this call, 
And I think going back to the re regulatory seminar we did a little while back, I think uh, he's indicated that the MHRA have applied for membership of the IMDRF um, as independent from the EU. So they seem to be taking steps in that direction. And certainly everything I've heard is that they are supportive of anything they can do to raise the or reduce the barriers to trade or even open the barrier the opportunity the gates for trade so um i think uh, uh, you know i i heard they were they were seeking a fast track towards um imdrf membership which may th then bring in md sap uh, and other mutual recognition vehicles because i think there's um the other guys will probably know more about it and i guess ed would know most there um on this particular point is that the MDSAP is, only, is primarily about audit of the quality management system. I think there are other mutual recognitions that, uh, that go deeper than uh, in that regulatory forum. Um, but the, the other point from a consultation may be worth considering is um, uh, the cost of transferring. Cost is quite a massive issue for in a regulatory environment now. And um, certainly year one, my understanding of the year one costs are, are quite prohibitive. Um, thereafter, I think it gets a lot easier, but it'd be interesting to know if there's any perspective on uh, climbing that mountain in year one uh, that, uh, that the group have, uh, have any thoughts on that we can feed back. Sorry, I thought you were gonna say something, Gwyn. <laughs> Sorry, I was waiting. I thought that was one for Ed. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. I don't know if Ed's got a thought on that one. He's come online now. So, Ed? Yeah, it, you know, it is um, It is a mountain to climb to, um, you know, bring about that, that transition to um, beyond a quality management system. Yes, there are wider benefits in bringing MD SAP into, you know, into a manufacturing company, not just from a quality management system, but in my experiences, when I've actually introduced MDSAP and you know gone through the rigorous um, accreditation process, to enable the sales and marketing guys to go go out there and tender for business, you know, on an international scale, is is also you know winning customers for for the right reasons to enable said business continuity to go forward is is all about providing confidence and sending a very clear message out um, in and around patient safety, um, meeting general safety and performance requirements. But there are misperceptions about MD SAP in and around just, just being there to, to gain business for a recognized quality management system. Now, when you've had Japanese inspectors or Brazilian government inspectors fly into the UK to assess a company, they're not just looking at the quality management system. They're looking at the premises, the environment, um, the products, the, the management team. You know, they're, they're wanting to take away recognition that this company can consistently produce and provide in meeting their commercial requirements or their quality agreements um, to enable, you know, business to to commence. So it's not just about a quality management system. They look way beyond the systems when they come to site. I've experienced um, those sets of inspectors spending up to four to five days on a site. Um, you know, they're, they're lifting the carpets, they're going into clean rooms and sterilization plants and you name it, um, to understand that nothing's gonna get out that door to, um, Present risk to an end user beyond the levels of, of the quality management system. So it's not just about systems, it's about product realization, it's about validation, it's about machinery, it's about health and safety, it's about controlled environments, everything that impacts within that organization that therefore gives it's the opportunity for a company to go and win business because they can present themselves that way. And there is a cost. Of course, there's a cost to everything. But um, now, 
Kel, th thanks for that. Um, from my my perspective, do you, uh, and this has cropped up with things like uh, um, the the new ISO standards as they come in one three four eight five etc. Do you see um, a move to MD SAP as a kind of um, a kind of I'm going to call it an offline activity, but I think you know where I'm coming from. That is away from the normal quality processes, i.e., that um, companies, particularly SMEs, need to plug in expertise to deal with that step in year one, particularly, um, particularly because of the depth and breadth of everything that they're covering. Or do you see this as something that they should be able to do just by a bit of reorganising the however many is it 176 pages of checklists or there's something of that, <laughs> I believe. Well, you know, you hit the nail on the head, Andy, because I've just done that for two clients, and it took me um, less than a month to pour that information onto a transparent spreadsheet to enable them to see where those requirements would impact across their existing systems and procedures. And to bring that change around um, with a consultant or working with their regulatory management team, three to six months to bring that change in. So I've produced um, mm -hmm. two, two massive um, templates for want of a better description that give you the entire width and breadth of how 123 articles across 10 chapters and 17 annexes of 175 page directive actually look so you can look at the charter that I've developed and you can predetermine what's applicable and what's not applicable without spending weeks and months delving into procedures and processes. It's a one-stop map. It says, there you go. That's our product. It falls into that device category for its intended purpose. What's necessary to change within our systems and our procedures to, to claim M M MD sub compliance. Bang. It's and, done and right. Is, just thinking ahead, I'm thinking broader from the Midi Wales con uh, consultation point of view. Um, now, uh, uh, forgive me if I uh, step on the consultancy toes here, but is that is that start point something which um, Welsh government could look to? I don't know baseline across the whole sector from you. And then uh, you know, then it's the imp then it's the implementation, which is where uh, you know where where the hard work comes in, be it internal or external. I mean, is that something that is you know you're considering in your mind in terms of how you market that particular uh, hard work yes. that you've been through? Yeah, I'm being asked for it right now. You know, I've had CEOs come on to me. Um, so I've been to site and, you know, they're looking to utilize skills and training for their wider teams to enable them to make this transition. And, you know, when you're talking to, to groups of teams within a given organization, you know, quality can become a very dry subject. So what I try to do is take that away from the form and present a document that's self-explanatory. You know, what does our quality system actually look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, rather than rounds of procedures and process maps, what does the big picture look like? Well, here it is. Mm -hmm. That's exactly a finger on the post. And we don't have to spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes trying to determine where that impact, what this charter does. It shows you, it tells you, and it works. You know, I've, I've actually done this now for the last three years with various clients of mine demonstrating, um, yes, the document's mine. Yes, I've created it, and it's taken a lot of hard work to bring that to oh, the forefront. Yeah. Yeah. But as I've said, you know, who wants to read 175 pages to determine what's, what's required and what's not? Um, I can break that down into, into one map very quickly. Okay. So, ha so uh, ha just looking on this, how do Medi Wales members and the broader medtech community in Wales get their hands on something like that as a way of, uh, pre you know, preempting what goes on? This is just conversation with you, is it? And your details are on there anyway, I guess. More or less, yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yep. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, I know we've gone down the track of uh, MD SAP for a for a bit of time. Um, which is probably worth doing. Um, looking at the, back to the sort of where we are today, 
Um, I, I wonder, it, it's, it's an area which should be fairly straightforward, but I wonder if it's still the case, um, is uh, in terms of the establishment of the UK representatives, and this may be more relevant to our uh, NHS uh, colleagues, uh, in terms of that seemed to sort of sneak in. Everyone knows about EU representatives, um, but what about the um, uh, what about the reversal from the European comp uh, companies supplying the NHS? Has that all gone smoothly so far? Because as I understand it, that had to be in place January the first, unless I've misunderstood the regulations. So I don't know if Pete or Chris have got some comments they want to make on that, or anybody else for that matter. Uh, we haven't seen any impact on this at the moment, Andy, but I think that's mainly because <clears throat> we are still accepting CE marked uh, product in, into uh, the NHS. So I, um, my guess is that, that, that therefore that hasn't had any impact on supply at the moment. Well, I'm right though, aren't I? The, they were supposed to have these people in place. I mean, I don't know where they register it. Yeah, so the UK responsible person, um, you will have to have one of those to place a device uh, on, the, on, the, on the Great Britain market. Um, and it's, uh, it's in, in January, they said manufacturers should aim to appoint their UK responsible person as soon as possible. Um, but the, 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 that, that's all to do with the registration of devices and the registration <clears throat> is that timetable I was talking earlier about earlier on, where there are different registration requirements depending on your class of device. So class one devices, custom made devices, must be registered from 1st of January 2022, class mm -hmm. 2B and, and class 2A from 1st September this year, and class 3S and class 2B from the 1st of May this year. So from we, I'm, I'm sure we will start seeing an impact. If, if people haven't got these responsible people in place, that, that wouldn't allow them to register from May onwards. Do, do you think they're, um, the Europeans, have, or, and the Americans for that matter, but particularly the Europeans are affected by this, do you think they're fully aware of these points? I mean, I don't know how much has been communicated. I think it sort of snuck in a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, it, Too I mean, early to say. As I said, the, 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 the MHRA document is a fairly straightforward read, I think. Um, so anybody who wanted to sell their medical device into the UK and hasn't read it uh, has got a bit of a problem because <laughs> there, there is, there's the potential that they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to um, sell, legally sell into the, into the UK. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think there is, there's, there is a question as who is going to police this and ensure mm -hmm. that everybody selling into the UK is, is in compliance with the new requirements from, from May onwards. Um, or, or depend on your class of device, of course. I, su I suspect that the, the class three devices, <clears throat> those manufacturers will be all over this because they're, they're huge multinationals with very high value medical devices. I think the issues will probably come with the class one devices in, in a couple of years time. Um, and the class one devices are from- September 2022, was it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I suspect that's when we're going to see the biggest impact because you'll know that there are many class one de uh, device manufacturers out there who um, don't pay due attention to, to regulations, whether it be the MDD or MDR. We've, in the pandemic, we've seen um, medical device suppliers from, from China who are still claiming compliance with the 1998 M medical device directive. So um, I suspect that's when we'll see the impact. I, di I didn't know you went back that far, Pete. <laughs> uh, that's very kind of you to say so Andy. <laughs> Chris you, uh, you've come back on here do you want to make a comment yeah I, I agree I, I disagree with Pete to be honest it's, uh, but I agree it, it's too early it's too early at the moment to see, okay. to see that impact it, it does worry me though Andy because um, you can imagine we've got very mm. good long lasting relationships with a number of the global players um, as far as medical devices are concerned, and normally when we see sort of even small changes to the to the sort of regulatory landscape, we normally have well, I'll, I'll normally have a number of conversations with these with these individuals and companies, but I've had nothing whatsoever, and that could be as a consequence of the pan pandemic that they're busy in other areas. But 
it does worry me to be honest that at some point over the next few months we are going to see um, an impact right okay no uh, that's that's a good point um, I am aware of uh, certainly one company that distributes for others that have taken on some of the UK representation for mm. for those particular companies so it, it may be where it's a UK distributor this is going to be a bit easier to adopt than than a, than a sort of an external company with their own uh, organization don't know um, certainly I, have seen that Pete you're going to say something yeah I, I just wonder where I mean I, if you want to find a notified body, that's easy. There, there are, you know, the, um, uh, the EU have um, a database where, that, where, where you can find them. I mean, you, you're, you're going you're to talk about to the Nando them. database, though. Yeah, and 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 there, there's a, there's a document on um, it's on the I think it's on the MedDev site, where, which is a PDF you can download, which lists the various notified bodies for PPE and, and medical devices. Um, at the moment, I'm not aware of any. Um, database that that uh, somebody who's interested in finding a responsible person could point towards, and I, I just wonder is is that something that MediWorld could could collate for for their mm. members and until there's something something's available nationally. I, I think that's a good idea. So I don't know if Gwyn's listening in or Debbie. I know they're both on the call, but. Uh... Gwyn's coming on. Hey, are Gwyn? Yeah, it, seems, it seems like we're getting all the homework from this session. <laughs> so, and your, pro and your so, problem is? <laughs> so organise an MHRA seminar and, um, and develop a directory of, uh, of QPs or <laughs> responsible people for, um, for, 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 yeah. for our members. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, and it's, it's going to be for the importers and distributors, of course, because the um, yes. Manufacturers haven't got that issue. It's going to be your members who are, who are bringing in devices from um, elsewhere. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good point. Um, Pete, you touched on another area, which um, which I, uh, well, two areas that I was thinking we should probably air. Um, one is notified bodies. Yeah, they're really good. They're really easy because there's plenty of them. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> we had this conversation last time, I think. Um, there were plenty of them. Um, the MDR seemed to have scared a few off. Um, I had personal experience of that, and I know other companies that had experience of it more than once, um, who seemed to back the wrong horse on more than one occasion. Um, with all the, with the risk of complexity, and I, I wonder whether this is a point that is a consultation point, um, that if we are challenged in terms of notified body of one availability their staff availability and the costs incurred as a result of the pressures not to mention the time scales that are being extended um are we looking at something here which is the the vehicle that, that is not fit for purpose and i'm sure charles would have some thoughts on that as well so perhaps we could have five pennyworths on that as well please I'll, I'll just quickly t tell you what I think one of the problems we have is with the UK approved bodies because there are only three at the moment, Andy. Um, yep. but BSI, SGS, UL. UL, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what, what none of us know at the moment is what their capacity is like. And that if I was a manufacturer, um, that, would, that would concern me. Mm. Chris, you've got uh, you've got your finger on the innovation pulse. You've got a nice little unit down there. Um, how are you going to get these damn things registered? Yeah, to, to be honest, it, it 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 did concern me a few months ago. As far as you know, we tend to deal with mainly BSI, um, but um, capacity wise, because we're we're in the middle of registration for the new team for 13485 um, and we haven't seen any impact and I've, I've discussed it with them um, with a few of the auditors um, and they seem quite confident now maybe they're confident with what they've what they've what they sort of seen at the moment what the future will look like you know I don't know but um, but I would assume that BSI will gear up ready for that I can't comment on SGS maybe Pete's got more insight into that because obviously they they look after our HSDUs and sterile services across Wales. Um, um, but yeah, BS, BSI seem quite confident at the moment. Did you think that's, Chris, that's because at the moment, or all that, what, what's happened is that people who used to use BSI as their notified body have transitioned across to them? Mm. 
maybe so there's been no, maybe. no change in workload. Yeah, I, I don't well, know, Pete. To be honest, I, I think because I, have I, they I, have I, they seen? Because uh, what the one thing they haven't said to me is have they seen an increase in workload? Right. Um, I don't think they've seen much. They've seen an increase, but but maybe not to the to the level that they could expect at some point in the future. You know, because because. There, there are because my I think if you're a, a UK manufacturer using a UK notified body, then you know probably everything's going to work out okay. If you're a UK manufacturer who's been using continental notified body, mm -hmm. that's a, that, I think that's a different scenario, and 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 that's where I suspect the pressure will yeah. come from because you can no longer use the you know there are plenty of UK companies who've used um, Polish uh, notified bodies, for example. Um, because of, of, of prices and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, and in the future, they'll no longer be able to, to, to do that for the UK market. I mean, of course, they'll have to continue to use them uh, for a, a continental uh, notified body if they want to get, continue with their CE mark. Um, but I, I just wonder whether we haven't reached that pressure point where people have had to, mm -hmm. they've withdrawn from the, the, the continental notified body and they haven't, and they haven't actually had to have an inspection or whatever from a, a UK approved or UK AB, as we've been. So oh, is this is this a top tip here that you need to have a notified body that has a foot in both camps? Hmm. I, I think it would be helpful, probably. And I mean, uh, but I, I think the prob problem is that it's um, you know th there's only going to be a small number hmm. of of hmm. those. Um, do do UL have a European base? I'm not. I know SGS and I know BSI do. I'm not sure about UL. I don't know. Um, no. no um, don't and know. actually, the the other the other side, and maybe Charles has got a perspective and wants to come in on this, is um, the uh, um, Chris mentioned one three four eight five, and maybe that's a bit easier. I'm wondering whether the product registration, the technical files, are going are the harder call on these things rather than the facilities and the quality management systems yeah absolutely andy i mean um, you know i build technical files for clients i know the complexity of them given you know the product specifications device classification etc so a one three four eight five technical files become quite easier to pour together than um a technical file that's um be claiming other regulations or other standards um, to enable that product to be distributed um, far wider than the UK. So, um, you know, more recently companies have um, transitioned away from NRQA uh, typically to register with TUV. Uh, yeah, TUV yeah. are absolutely snowed under at the moment. They're not, you know, they're not taking any new clients. Um, existing companies are in a pecking order to, to get their technical files assessed, which means until they have been assessed, you know, that some of those products are going to be put on hold. So things cascade down accordingly, um, depending on, you know, where we were um, before Brexit and where we were, where notified bodies are, are you know, diverted away from the MDR. So we are starting to see those, I'm starting to see those ripples within organizations. I deal with one client that's covered both bases because he's got two companies within his organization under one roof. One company is registered with SGS and the other company is registered with PSI. Yeah. Um, so there are ways to, you know, um, protect the business um, to enable continuity of work and, and, this, and, and sales. But beyond that, um, yeah, technical files um, are going to be coming more under the scrutiny of the likes of BSI, given the M MDR. And what I'm also seeing with in relation to BSI and my involvement with them down a number of years, um, they are bringing resourcing from Europe to support their um, their clients. And I'm constantly talking to Europeans and, and the likes um, in and around <laughs> You know, um, technical files that I've presented, and then you get into those sort of misinterpretation issues. Well, mm -hmm. you know, if you read the standard or if you read 
Alex one or whatever it is that you've got a concern with, show me within the standard why you think I need to put that information into the technical file. So, you know, I've actually asked notified bodies to stop the audits, um, have a separate conversation in a boardroom to say, this audit's not continuing because your auditor mm -hmm. is not auditing to the appropriate standards and requirements the assessment or the periodic assessment so we're getting into a little bit of that now as well which is very difficult um, in terms of you know the relationship that you don't want to um, challenge but at the same time um, you're not going to be forced down a route at cost in time to enable a technical file to be assessed by someone outside of the UK that is, is not totally, um, for whatever reason, converse, conversant with um, those regulations. It, it's just, and a lot of auditors are, are jumping as well. You know, they're jumping from one notified body to another to another. Yeah. Um, some of which I've employed, which which makes life interesting. You know, I turn up, they turn up. And yeah, it, you don't want that bun fight. You just want continuity. You want harmonized approach. You want, you want recognition that they're understanding exactly what you're led to understand to enable work to continue. It's it's problematic and, it, and I, I see it, you know, I see it all the time. So, sorry, sorry, Chris. Uh, sorry, I just finish off, sorry. So yeah, there there is a concern around you know um, the fulfilment of companies being able to reach out to another notified body for the purpose of meeting MDR. BSI can only manage so much. Mm -hmm. um, TV can only manage so much. You know, as, as we've touched on here in the UK, SGS I, I work with all the time, um, and they're struggling big time. Yeah. So I'm seeing I'm seeing the three year um, periodic. Uh, QMS assessment dates being pushed out. I'm seeing technical file assessments being pushed out. Um, that plays into the hands to a degree, but when that file does get requested um, for review, is it being maintained in real time? And what are the implications around product safety mm -hmm. um, in relation to the declaration of conformity? So if customers, sorry, if manufacturers aren't mindful and proactive, around how they're going to fulfill those technical file requirements, then, you know, they're going to find themselves in deep trouble on many fronts. So, yeah, that's an interesting point. So in, in some ways, do you think the, the whole move to, let's call it MDR just for the moment, and obviously with the UK complexity to that, um, but do you think ultimately this is having a, um, a, a, an opposite effect on the quality and, uh, surety of patient safety because of these things uh, not directly with regards to patient safety because most manufacturers are, are more than mindful that you know a product's got to perform it's got to it's got to meet its intended purpose through testing through validation so unless there's a critical change that's impacted on a process or a supplier or said material then that product should should still effectively be deemed safe. Now, what, I, what I'm seeing are manufacturers that aren't conducting regulatory risk assessments, aren't maintaining their technical files in and around class one devices, mm -hmm. typically, and consequently there may be elements of risk creeping into you know the bigger picture. But you typically go, like most notified bodies and people tell you this and others that, you know, in my experience, uh, when notified bodies come to site, the first place they predominantly go is complaints and vigilance um, because they want to get into, you know, real-time reporting to establish, you know, if anything has been reported up to the MHRA, field safety corrective actions, recall actions. So that's the first port of call because directly you're getting the finger on the pulse of that company. And if those databases or those breaches aren't being managed within those reportable timelines, then... You know, they've got no product to sell. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, think that's a, I think that's a good point. Uh, I've noticed, just for everyone's benefit, I hope you've seen the point that uh, Pete put on there, that UL International ceased operation as a notified body September 2019. 
and they now partner with a Polish notified body. Is there any more to add to that, Pete? No, not, not really. But um, with regards to the MDR, Andy, and the impact for that, we were starting to see an impact. Um, as Chris said earlier on, most of our um, SS, uh, CSSDs, uh, our sterile service departments, mm -hmm. um, are, um, get their uh, MDD certification from SGS. And we've certainly seen um, people taking advantage of the, of the, um, the, the forthcoming MDR, as, as it was at the time, to mm -hmm. increase prices and extend the, 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 the length of visits. Um, and I, I think what, what, what happened in the last few years is that people's um, regulatory costs from notified bodies went up quite, quite significantly. They did, yeah, definitely. So, uh, Chris, you've got some comment to make. Just to add to, um, to, to what Charles said and, and Pete really, I mean, um, I don't think it's the same position across the board. If you, if you look at sort of SGS and BSI, um, if I was to pick up the phone to SGS today and I've got no interest in either, either notified body, by the way, mm -hmm. um, but I struggle to get a hold of, of SGS at the moment, if I'm perfectly honest, mm -hmm. whereas BCI, um, BSI seem to be quite receptive. So again, you know, is that because, you know, it's, it's work as normal or is it because they've increased their, their resources to, to deal with the, you know, the possible influx on uh, an additional demand. I, I don't know, but, um, but BSI are very reactive at the moment whenever we ask a question. I, th I think from the from BSI point of view, because I've experienced of uh, predominantly BSI, um, they do seem to resource themselves um, as well as they can. But as Charles has mentioned, the the sort of people in the notified body world, they move around, you know, they're, they're hired guns these days. I'm not sure if it's quite the same in the technical file area, but th than compared with the 13485 auditing, but uh, that is a, a bit of an issue. But it, it, it's uh, one of the areas which, while we've been talking, I, I do wonder whether, um, as a broad point on consultation, and because of the involvement the, M, uh, the uh, MHRA had on uh, the notified body, sorry, on uh, the MDR, whether to reduce complexity, we're actually supporting where the M MHRA were coming from by largely adopting the good bits of the MDR. Um, I don't know whether that's, a, it's not revolutionary, it's almost uh, probably politically unacceptable, but since the, the MHRA created so much of this, you know, shouldn't we be adopting most of it? I'd be interested I, in your thoughts yeah, on that. I'd agree, I, to be honest, and I, I, I don't want to get involved in the in the politics of all of this but yeah. I'm, I'm sure if you you know peter and i you know i'm sure charles the same no colleagues and friends within the mhra we will give you the let's call it the off the record opinion and um i think because we've gone through or we've gone through such a long consultation process in, in with regards to development of mdr mm. um oh, okay we we sort of you know we had to concede on a number of fundamental points but on the whole i think mhra were reasonably happy with mdr and mm -hmm. I think, you know, given, given a preference, they would have adopted MDR, yeah. if I'm perfectly honest. Um, yeah. but, but I think Brexit and sort of, you know, everything else, unfortunately, has, has made me maybe muddy the waters in that respect. Yeah, well, I've heard the term MD, MDD plus mentioned, but Pete, you've got a comment. Yeah, I was, no, Chris is right. I mean, the M MHRA were very influential mm. in, in writing the MDR. Um, they are, are a, were a big hitter in Europe, they were probably have one of the best reputations out of all the competent authorities across Europe as well. Um, and, and oddly enough, not, not just um, our competent authority, but our notified bodies, because um, BSI used to do a lot of the class three work across Europe as well. And, and one of the concerns about Brexit was that um, European companies who relied on some of our notified body expertise would lose access to that expertise. So, um, yes, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I don't think this has been, I, I will stick my hat, my, my foot into the political mire here. I don't think this has been good for you, UK industry because mm -hmm. I do think it then introduces unnecessary complications for them on the, on, on the back of, you know, the, the potential economic benefits of new global relations, which are, which are not there yet. Mm. And, uh, and, and I think well, what the impact on UK in industry is that they, they are going to have to spend more money now just on 
you know, something that generates no new business. Um, right. Just complying with regulations doesn't doesn't do anything for you apart apart from allow you to sell something you've already developed. Mm. Um, and so it, it's an unnecessary expense, really. I think. Um, so yeah, it, and uh, so I do think, therefore, that come back to your, your earlier question, that the MHRA will adopt a lot of the MDR mm -hmm. because. Most of what you see there are things that the MHRA pushed for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think there's a sensible uh, element to that. Um, another area, uh, just when we're talking um, M MDR, um, we've not really covered too much on the diagnostics side of things. So the I, uh, IVDR and where that's going is that going to be paralleled? Is it going to be different? Um, because the the diagnostics guys, not all of these were registered before. And I remember talking to, uh, I can't remember his surname now, but Steve at the ABHI, um, that there was going to be a bit of a, a, a traumatic step for a lot of diagnostics organisations who were suddenly going to see themselves regulated as opposed to being unregulated. And we've got a mix of industry in our med tech sector which is not only about devices, is also about diagnostics. So I wonder if that's an area we should explore as well. Anyone got any comment? Pete, you got a comment on that? No, um, it, IVDs is not an area I know anything about. I really can't speak competently about it. I've got you. I've got you, got you in a dark place for once. <laughs> wow. Well, that's an achievement in itself. Uh, Charles, uh, sorry, Ed, you've got a comment there. Yeah, I'm working and have been working with uh, a couple of clients here with uh, IV, IVDs and new products falling into the new classification rules as a consequence of um, 17746 regulation surrounding those requirements. So it is bringing around, you know, more scrutiny, more procedural measures, more time, more cost being incurred. Mm -hmm. um, in maintaining, you know, technical files for, for products, whether they self-certify directly to the MHRA. Again, you know, that's more time, more resource to manage um, the complexity of how that company or those companies, those clients are currently structured. So they're having to change the dynamics to bring about um, the skill sets, the requirements necessary in meeting um, IBD, IBDR devices that are, as I've said, falling into that classification sector, mm -hmm. but also um, more understanding what impact that those regulations are having on their current products, computers, uh, processes, suppliers, you know, the, the playing field is being extended beyond um, the existing field where um, T's have got to be crossed, I's have got to be dotted, things have got to be written down more because if, it, if it's not written down it didn't happen and then the, the technical file falls into disrepair. I've spent the last 12 months um, supporting two key clients of mine um, to enable them to represent technical files but also to get product to market um, for IBDRs. So, um, I do work across, as I said earlier in my presentation, um, I do work across both industries and both sectors. I understand, um, mm -hmm. you know, what those devices are, um, what they can be, um, given the, the, rule, the rules of classification now and the categories that those products now fall into. It was, uh, Gwyn's kindly reminded me, it was Steve Lee at the ABHI I was talking, I was thinking to, and he made a point to me, and you probably uh, reflect this, um, that diagnostics, whereas the uh, the, the IVDs, whereas 90% of them were probably not regulated, now it's probably flipped to only 10%. Is that, is that the yeah. way you see it? Yeah, that's the way it is um, currently. Um, yeah, I was working with a diagnostic uh, manufacturer yesterday talking about this very subject matter. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it's a load more work, um, which is costing them, uh, which slows things down. And, but there's no, there's no way out at the moment, you know. Um, they're being, I wouldn't say forced, 
they're being alerted to changes necessary in maintaining their product technical class. So, so um, if they're devi if at the moment they have little regulation, is the I and they don't have the equivalent of the MDD. What, what happens in the next, you know, for the next what two years or two and a bit years? Are they on the same time frame as the devices? The IBDRs. Yes. The IBDRs in the UK they, first of all, you know, in the UK particularly. They've got five years. It's five years, isn't it? I thought yeah. it was longer. Yeah. Yeah. It's five years. So it's it's less critical from that point of view. Yeah. Well, okay. full application of the ID. Sorry, full application for the IBD regulation is 26 of May 2022. Right. Okay. Okay. So it's uh, it's a slight it's a longer time frame, but but they've got a bigger hill to climb because it's a, it's new development on a lot of registration there. So correct. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so um, the um, I, I don't know. Uh, in all of this melee, does um, does OEM and own label products? Do they um, turn out to be in a better position or a worse position, or are people just sort of pull the hair out and say we're not doing that anymore? We've got to make our own product because our industry is contra it, you know has a lot of contract work. Um, you know, and people making things for other people and bits for other people. Um, has anyone any uh, any thoughts on what happens there? It might be you more you, Ed, on this one. Unless oh, Chris, Chris has come back online on this one. Chris, you got any thoughts on that? Because you probably get people hmm. to make some of your innovations, I guess. Um, sorry, sorry, and I, I thought you were you were talking about sort of sharing devices between health institutions for that, that that isn't what you were talking about obviously well it wasn't there but it's a similar i guess it's a similar point because we're still under the same technical regulate regulations aren't we so how, how do you make that operate that might provide a useful insight here there, there is um, a very useful document that um, justin mccarthy published on our um, professional um, um website I, ipm website probably over a month back now where it looks at in-house manufacturer and um, mm. um, uh, looks at the definition around what a healthcare institution actually is from a from an MDR perspective and also an MDD perspective. Um, mm. um, but it's very grey if, if we're honest at the moment until we until we get to the point of the sort of the consolidated sort of regulatory framework document that hopefully we'll see some early this year. Um, but at the moment, it, it suggests that we. <clears throat> we can continue definitely within our own organizations mm -hmm. uh, to develop devices without C marking and any sort of um, regulatory sort of, albeit that has to be obviously under a quality system, 13485 or similar. Yeah. Um, and um, it suggests as well that we can share between um, health institutions as well, which has always been a bit of a no-no, to be honest, in the past. But um, the, the definition seems to suggest under MDD and or the revised 2020 MDD that we can actually do that but we're not in that position um, ourselves at the moment we will be over the mm -hmm. next few months but yeah. not at the moment okay yeah um, okay that's that's an interesting interesting take on it and the I, I don't know if Pete's any more anything to add there but he hasn't he hasn't come on so that's fine um, yeah. but, uh, the oh, it's, he just came on then. I'm Pete? just saying, Andy, I, I don't know. You don't? Okay, right, thanks. Um, the, the area which concerns me most, and I think we've kind of been touching on it all the way through, is um, do we have enough people with the capabilities and the education, the training, to actually, uh, to, to actually make all this happen? Um, and, you know, is there a part of this consultation that Medi-Well should put, put back to... Uh, uh Welsh government and mhra that you know someone needs to provide a lot more regulatory types audit types quality uh, quality people um than we have at the moment um i speak from personal and slightly bitter experience that i've i've brought a load of people into life sciences who stay for a couple of years and then go and get a bigger job for a load more money um it just seems to be a shortage then probably end up in a notified body um, or maybe even the MHRA. So 
uh, it's you know the resources to make this happen we've, we've touched on notified bodies but what about the people there Pete yeah so what during the pandemic you may be aware that there was an initiative for the UK to develop its own PPE and manufacture it yes um, and we've been involved both in the Welsh initiative for that and we've been involved with the UK Gov uh, PPE make um, mm -hmm. project. Uh, the one thing that's been very clear to me is that, um, that people just have not been able to get the technical advice they need to comply with the regulations. And, and time after time, we've seen manufacturers who are very competent, who are making good products. Uh, okay, these are all pretty much class one devices, but they're, yeah. they're gowns and they're masks and, and um, visors. Uh, but um, they've been and they haven't got through the regulatory hurdles because they haven't been able to get good quality regulatory advice. Um, and that has put back some of them. So some of them, they were ready to manufacture in the autumn mm -hmm. and they haven't made a sale yet because they were they haven't had their QMS certified, for example, or they haven't been able to apply their CE mark until recently because they couldn't get their technical file in order. So. It, it, is a, it is an issue. I, I don't think it's just an issue of, of resource, Andy, by the way. I also think okay. it's about manufacturers who, who are new into the industry, uh, into the medical device industry, not understanding what they need. And that's, that's definitely a big, a big problem. So I, how, how you so it's a kind now? of it's a kind of training training as well as it's a knowledge and training as well as resource and skills. Yes. It, yeah. it, 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 it's somebody who thinks, well, I, I realize I've got to put a CE mark on and I, I need a 13485 quality management system. So I'll get that. I'll stick the CE mark on. And then you say, where, where is your essential requirements checklist to show that you mm. comply with it, the, the whole of the medical device directive? Mm. And they say, oh, I haven't got one of those. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, and I, I don't know how you sort that problem, by the, by the way. Um, because how, how do you make sure that people you don't know about are put in touch with the, with the, with the right advice? It's a tricky one, isn't it? Uh, maybe they need to, I see Chris has uh, probably got a comment to make there, but you know, some of this must be about getting the people into our industry, um, i.e. trying to bring in you know, new skills, new people. Um, and some of it must be a kind of go-to um, support because uh, I know and we've talked on a couple of cases uh, I think Pete you know of examples where people needed regulatory support regulatory and um, and um, uh, quality support and it's interesting to hear that as you know that that stopped people ultimately now that now that might be good for um, you know to, to for somebody but it generally in terms of the Welsh economy in terms of the Welsh development of uh, new products and new ways of doing things. It, you know, life science is an important sector and it, it's, it doesn't help us, does it, at all? No. Chris, you've got a comment you want to put in there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a comment in relation to sort of external consultancy, but, but as far as um, internal sort of um, understanding and, and training and awareness is concerned around the, the regulatory framework, the, the National School for Healthcare Science, probably about five, six years ago, um, changed, um, well, probably longer than that actually now, but, but changed the, the healthcare science pathway across the UK for, for training and sort of different levels of sort of um, competence for, for, for various individuals. But what, what was interesting was that the, the clinical scientist trainees, so if you imagine they've all got different specialties, so they could be mm -hmm. cardiorespiratory, they could be rehabilitation engineering, but one of them, one of the distinct specialities now is medical device risk and governance. So as far as the future is concerned, you know, we've got a clinical scientist starting with us now in September and we're feeding these, these, uh, these young individuals with as much regulatory advice as we possibly can. And we're mm -hmm. doing that across the UK um, so that hopefully, you know, in the future, we'll have a lot more internal knowledge that we can, we can support then 
both both you know the, from an NHS perspective, but also an, from an external perspective as well. But that doesn't sort out the interim and and, and the issue. Well, at all. just to, I've I've never heard of the National School of Health for Healthcare Science. Perhaps you could put a, a link on that for us. I will. Um, yeah. But is that the kind of thing that are, are they? You know, as someone who's employed uh, year in industry students and also. Um, well, the ones sort of shorter periods, like over the summer breaks and things, is that does that that school actually adopt things like that so that SMEs particularly could take on someone to do a project uh, to help them with some sort of regulatory hurdle they're trying to get through? I don't think I don't think they do at the moment. They um they've got a specific role in across England, Scotland, and Wales and Ireland around obviously you know clinical scientists. Mm. training ptp which is our practitioner um, level training um but i think there's definitely an opportunity to do those sort of summer schools really and, um, and use our expertise yeah well yeah. certainly um we've done quite a bit of work uh, when i was in with my dtr hat on uh, we did quite a lot of work with uh, swansea school of um, engineering particularly the medical engineers and uh, they do tend to have quite a regulatory background certainly in fact, for engineers, it was generally better for us to get mechanical engineers. Uh, but for those with a regulatory uh, penchant, let's say, um, they were well trained and were good to pick up those sorts of things. And uh, I would encourage the, that school to do likewise and offer sort of um, either summer or even year in industry placements because there's a benefit to be had and nearly all of them come out with first class degrees um, rather than uh, because they've, they've been able to apply themselves and a, and a lot of this is about experience and application isn't it in terms of making these things work so maybe that's an area that we should put in thanks for putting that up on the uh, on the link there Chris appreciate that Charles I don't know I think I saw your mute go off for a moment and then come back on again have you got something you want to uh, to add yeah, I was just picking up on, um, you know, skills, competence, um, capability of um, individuals coming into, you know, um, the regulatory um, environment within said organisations. And you're absolutely right. I mean, there there is a need, there's a necessity to bring um, more people in, um, giving them the support, training, awareness necessary so they can adapt and um, provide value um, with regards to um, design development, technical core management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, I'm, I'm developing um, a wider um, extended arm and my business services now mm -hmm. by providing workshops um, for those types of um, individuals within a given organisation, whether it's IBD or MDR, to enable them to grasp the total subject matter, benefit from the training, the knowledge necessary to give them confidence to go back into the workplace and apply those skills. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in, the, um, in the realms of providing training currently at the moment, but trying to free some more time up to, to put that out there um, through right. LinkedIn to uh, enable manufacturers to come on and say, can you provide training? Yes. Yeah. Who, should, who should attend the training? And, and you know, agenda, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so um, I'm trying to do my little bit, as it were, um, to bring to bring that knowledge. You know, I like to inspire people, and I can't take my knowledge to the grave. So, you know, <laughs> put, put put it back into the industry. <laughs> That's uh, that's very commendable, Charles, and uh, thank you. I, th I think those those things are absolutely necessary, um, and uh, it's uh, great to hear that you're doing those kind of things. Um, I don't know if anyone has any uh, questions amongst those who are listening in. We've had they've been patiently uh, listening or having their uh, microphones on, but I just wonder whether each of us has got some closing comments before we hand back to Gwen. Um, Pete, do you want to go first? And, and the only area I was going to sort of th perhaps whisper in your direction, and you just touched on it, was um, where where the regulation on PPE is likely to go, which I know is one of your favourite topics, but uh, maybe the moment has passed on that one. But I'll leave that to you to make some comment. I'm not going to talk about PPE because the uh, I've 
I've not been looking at um, the, the new um, PPE reg, re regulatory requirements. Um, at the moment, the NHS has, we think, over a year's worth mm -hmm. of, of pandemic rate PPE. Um, once we get to business as usual, it's going to be a, a much more than that. So we don't think PPE is going to be the hot topic that it was. I mean, I, I do think if, if you're a manufacturer at the, mo at the moment, you're going to have to make some careful choices over the next um, 12 months or so as to, you know, where, where your priorities lie in terms of what regulations, because if you are limited in, in your regulatory resource internally, you may well have to make a decision that you're going to stick with one set of regulations or, or the other. Um, you're probably going to be stuck with extra costs. Um, you know, you're going to be, you're going to have, if you, if you export, you're going to have to continue with your CE marking. You're going to have mm -hmm. to get UK CE regulatory compliance. And I think for the, the risk at the moment with the MHRA rewriting the regulations, and, and, and I don't think they're going to do this, but there is still a risk there that if they take the opportunity to make things better, the, to try and get in the things that they, they couldn't sneak in when, when they were writing the MDR, then you will end up with a, an, another set of hurdles that you, you're going to have to comply with. And that's going to make life more, more difficult to you. You're, and if, if you're um, you know, a large medical device manufacturer, you're complying with the FDA, you're going to have to comply with the EU requirements, and then you're going to have to comply with the UKCA requirements. And, and that's not a good place to be in. No. You know, when, when the rest of the world is trying to try, come to some sort of unified regulatory um, position. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't envy manufacturers at, at, at the moment, but the one thing I would, I would say is, you know, consult. When, when the MHRA come up for consultation, get your views, get your views in. That's yeah. the best thing you can do at the moment. Good, good point. Thanks for that scary comment and scary thought there, Pete. Um, that they might do something worse, but I do. But I do think that um, that the 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 the, um, the moves of the MHRA to be a bit more mutual are probably to our benefit. Um, I've seen a questions popped in uh, from Gail. Um, are there possibilities for sharing in-house devices between the NHS and universities? Chris, that's probably one for you. First off, is it? And perhaps you can make some final comments as well. And uh, if, it, if, it's, if it's under a research umbrella um, or a research trial, no problem whatsoever. The minute that device goes into clinical use, so, you know, they, they would determine then that, that is an, there's an element of commercial um, element to that then. And, um, and obviously then that would fall within the regulations. So, yeah, so, so the main point is you can, you can, you can do, the, the, the research element is pretty flexible. So we can share devices around, underneath that umbrella, yes. Okay. Pete, you were going to say something. But yeah, when, when, once, 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 you've, uh, once you're outside of the, of the research and if um, a, a university is manufacturing for another organisation, then it's the, same, it's the same as if you are um, a, any other manufacturer. It's the same as the NHS is, is caught if, with one SSD making um, or reprocessing devices for an SSD in another health board, they have to see e-market, they have to comply with the MDD, and that's not going to change. I mm -hmm. think the, the only thing that's going to happen is it's going to become tighter for yeah. in-house. Yeah. 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 Chris, do you want to move on and make any uh, final comments? Two, two final comments from me, um, Andy. Um, the first one is to reinforce Pete's point around the consultation. You know, you'll, you, we'll never get the result we, we, we need and expect, really, without people feeding into this consultation document. Um, unfortunately, we tend to sometimes bury our heads in the sand and hope that uh, these things will go away. Um, mm -hmm. But also, on, on the second point, I've got, um, I've got enormous confidence in the MHRA and the, the UK government to do the right thing. At the end of the day, you know, we've mentioned trade on a number of occasions during the meeting, and uh, what we don't want is a regulatory framework that stifles trade uh, between ourselves and other countries. Correct. Good point. Charles, um, I think you're still there. Is Charles still there? Seems to have disappeared, but um, I don't know. Charles, Charles had to leave at 10. Oh, he did, didn't he? Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll pass on our thanks for Charles. As you can see, he's um, active in helping companies across the board, either with individual things or, as we now learn, with training as well, which is great, is great to see. Um, 
just from uh, from me i mean i said cost complexity and capabilities were the three things i was looking at and clearly we're in a difficult uh, sort of period between the brexit starting and the mhra deciding on the direction of travel for the uk market but we have to consider europe the rest of the world etc um but i think there's probably a fourth c in there as you were saying pete and that is consultation and i am a great believer in if you don't tell the powers that be and the politicians particularly which way is up then you can't really complain when things come out turn out badly doesn't mean so they're going to turn out right i have to say but on the other hand um you have to put your uh, your thoughts into it because everyone has a different perspective and i think across business clinical and academic um, we have a fairly shared thought on these things and it affects the innovation, patient safety, product development and the economy and the future export opportunities that we're very good at. And life sciences, med tech, health tech, we are very good at uh, exporting what we do and keeping the barriers to a minimum whilst retaining the right balance of patient safety and the kind of, I think, pragmatism that the MHRA provide is really uh, the right sort of thing. So um, I'll, uh, I see Gwyn is there um, in his uh, master role, master of ceremonies role, supremo. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you for all those who are still on the call. I hope it's been useful. And um, I'm sure Gwyn and the MediWales team will be taking the comments straight from the, the recording to put into consultation. But I keep thinking about it and keep your ear to the ground on things that are happening because there may well be some last, last minute moves before it goes on. So thanks very much. Thanks for your comment there, Chris. Appreciate it. So uh, that's good. Gwyn, over to you. Right, I'm going to keep it short and sweet because uh, it's a beautiful day out there and I want everybody to be able to get a little bit of fresh air before, uh, before the end of the day. So uh, I am going to, but I am going to say thank you. Thank you very much to Chris. Thank you to Andy. Thank you to Pete. And uh, in his absence, thank you to Ed. Um, a, a wide ranging um, discussion where an, an awful lot of topics were, um, were, were, were covered. And, um, and uh, I really do appreciate that. My screen is frozen, so I'm not entirely sure anyone can see me anymore. Um, you yeah, can see me? No okay, well, I'll just carry yeah. on rambling then. And, and as I said, it, I'll, I'm going to keep it brief. Um, some things there for me to take home. Um, one is the, um, the awareness raising. The awareness raising of regulatory requirements. I think there's quite a lot of people on the call who might be now thinking, oh my God, what have I just been opened up to? This Pandora's box of regulatory compliance and three letter acronyms that uh, I didn't even realize existed. And I was about to set path to, uh, to innovate a new medical device or diagnostic product. So, um, so I think, I think, it's really important, and I say this whenever we do a regulatory um, session in a conference or a seminar, um, I say it's really important to know what your unknowns are. Um, and whether you understood everything that was discussed today, whether you are, need to be closely aligned with everything that you've heard today, you do need to know that these topics exist and they stand between you as an inventor or an innovator and marketing your product safely and legally. So, um, so I really do appreciate the, um, the expertise that we've had uh, um, today to, uh, to dip into those topics. Um, Chris and Pete, it's really great to have you guys on a, on a healthcare side of, of the uh, fence as well, um, because I know that we have, uh, for Connects, we have a lot of healthcare people who are innovators, who are supporting innovators. Mm -hmm. We have innovation leads who, uh, whose responsibility it is to uh, set people on that path. And it really is important that they know that, there's, um, that, that regulation is something they're going to have to grapple with and, um, and, and comply with. Um, per, just from a personal point of view, the, um, I, I think we could do another event on in-house manufacturing and in-house um, product development. Um, I, I'm hearing it from, uh, from the NHS side these days as being a, a, a low cost benefit. Um, as a way of um, streamlining activities and keeping costs of, uh, to, from the public purse down. But uh, when I first came into uh, medical technology, it was, uh, it, was, it was an issue to be put, for us to put a stop to. Because um, I, I started with, the, um, with um, trade associations and the British In Vitro Diagnostics Association in particular wanted to put a stop to it because they saw it as um, regulatory avoidance. 
um, and they saw and they, and they saw it as a hazard or a risk. So uh, I, I really would like to put both sides of that discussion on in in a panel and have have a couple of hours on on that entirely because I know uh, Chris, you've been managing this process with all the right safety and uh, regulatory requirements met, and uh, and I wouldn't doubt that for a second. So uh, mm. please don't think that I'm I'm saying that. But I did see, as Pete would probably te be testament to, that. Um, during the uh, COVID crisis, we had manufacturing of medical devices coming out of everywhere. Um, anyone who had a workshop table was a, was a medical device manufacturer. So, yeah. um, so uh, they, not everybody who is delivering in-house product development and in-house production might know about the regulatory um, compliance that they need to, uh, to adhere to, and especially when they're when they're supplying other organizations and swapping between organizations. So Chris, I know this is supposed to be a summary, but I saw your hand come up. Have I said anything there that you have a right to reply on before I finish? <laughs> <laughs> Just to reinforce, I do simplify things somewhat sometimes. So when we talk about work under a research umbrella, obviously you've got ethical approval and all sorts to, uh, to apply for uh, within that. Um, and also you still need to keep your technical file and you still need to operate within, within a quality system, just to make that point for everybody's benefit. Absolutely. And as I say, I wouldn't doubt that for a second. Um, so thank you very much, everybody who stuck with it till the end. I really appreciate that. Tomorrow morning, 9.30, we've got a stellar cast for our first session. We have got, um, well, we, we've got six health boards and Arch involved in an innovation showcase. We've got... Um, We've got Betsy Cadwallader, Chris Subé. He's always good value for money when we get him to speak. And uh, we've got Owen Hughes from Powys. We've got some bloke called Chris Hopkins from Haldar. Um, so <laughs> he, he, I, I, I've heard he's a good speaker and knows his <laughs> stuff. Um, and we've got Kumtaf, Swansea Bay, and, uh, and Sean Charles with his new hat from in, with Arch, uh, and, and then Tom James from An Iron Brevin. So, so excellent session to look forward to. That's 9.30 tomorrow morning. So we can, uh, although we're not finishing before five, we can definitely start a little bit later than normal uh, tomorrow. And, um, and, and, and I really wish that uh, at this point, we were adjourning to the bar for the, uh, for the inevitable conference debate about um couldn't agree about more problems. and particularly as it's been the highest temperature recorded for 53 years in march uh, it was in suffolk but i think we've kept our cool pretty well so we'll we'll take a rain check on that beer won't we chaps <laughs> well maybe the bar uh, maybe the garden in the uh, in in the, in the hotel bar but no, <laughs> thank you so much please join us again tomorrow and uh, so tomorrow's all about innovation from start to finish and then uh, and then the last day um, on Thursday, we've got um, we've got digital, um, and we're kicking that off with DHEW and with Ifan to uh, to to focus on digital for the day. So, brilliant! That's a wrap. Thank you very much, gents, and um, talk to you most of you tomorrow. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. <laughs>